welcome everybody. Um, and uh, I'm going to dive right in because even though we have an hour and a half today, uh, it feels to me like with this panel, especially time is of the essence. We have three really distinguished uh, historians uh, among us today. I'll introduce them briefly. I could, of course, give long lists of publications and, and awards and accomplishments, but I'll sort of keep it brief. Um, and uh, then what we'll do is proceed alphabetically through our panel. So we'll begin with Professor Plochi, turn then to Professor Radchenko, and thirdly to Professor uh, Zubok for a few opening thoughts about the question of the collapse of the Soviet Union, narrative, historiography. Uh, this is also a question that's very much in the politics uh, of Eastern and Central Europe uh, in the present day, uh, and you know, sort of can be discussed from very, very, very many different points uh, of view. We'll have a few uh, opening statements, informal opening statements from our historians. It would be nice then to have them to respond to each other, uh, as I'm sure they do on the printed page, but this is a nice occasion to have a kind of personal uh, compare and contrast conversation about the collapse. Uh, of the Soviet Union, and then roughly 45 minutes into today's conversation, we'll turn to uh, our students for, for questions that they can ask of our three panelists. So to give you the brief introductions, again, going uh, alphabetically, uh, Professor Serhi Plochi is, is familiar to everybody in the symposium. Uh, uh, by this point is Mikhailo Khrushchevsky, Professor of Ukrainian History and Director of the Ukrainian Research Institute at Harvard University. Uh, he's also the author of The Last Empire, the Final Days uh, of the Soviet Union, which is a book that came out with basic books uh, in, uh, in 2015. Professor Sergei Radchenko is Wilson E. Schmidt Distinguished Professor at Johns Hopkins SICE uh, School of Interna Advanced International Studies uh, and is the author of a 2014 Oxford University Press book titled uh, Unwanted Visionaries, the Soviet Failure uh, in Asia, which is not quite the collapse of the Soviet Union, but a topic that has some Bearing on that to be sure, and I gather from Twitter that Professor Rodchenko is soon to release a massive history of, uh, of the Cold War, uh, or that word soon is always a little bit relative when it comes to publishing monographs, but uh, relatively soon will be the, will be, is the author of that book and will very soon be the readers of that book, so perhaps that's uh, a material that Professor Rodchenko, if he wishes, could also bring into the discussion. And then we have, as our third panelist, Professor Vladislav Zubok professor in the Department of International History at the London School of Economics and Political Science uh, and author of a 2001 Yale University Press book titled Collapse, The Fall of the Soviet Union. So we're very grateful for your time and expertise today. Uh, let's turn first to Professor Plochi for a few uh, opening comments. Uh, first of all, thank you. Thank you, Michael, for this introduction and for the invitation to be on the panel. I really look forward to what, what my uh, co-participants on the panel have to say and what questions will be there. So the dis discussion is certainly the most important part uh, of, of any, any, any meeting, and uh, I'm sure it will be, it will be very productive. Uh, in terms of my uh, comments, uh, again, when I started working on the book on the fall of the Soviet Union, I put together a list of different interpretations that were out there, and they were numerous. Again, not, not uh, each uh, or every of these interpretations was getting a monographic treatment, but there were certainly articles, there were all sorts of suggestions made, and the list was quite long. And... I would say that issues of ideology would be and ideological collapse of, of the Soviet Union and Soviet system would be close to the top. There would be certainly discussion of, of uh, economy uh, as another important reason and uh, last but not least international politics. And when it comes to international politics, uh, the confusion that certainly was there during the 1990s later and to a degree continues today between uh, the um, end of the Cold War, between the Soviet collapse, uh, the um, ideological bankruptcy of, of uh, um, Soviet communism and collapse of the, of the Communist Party, all of that were inter, um, intermingled and all of that was together uh, reflecting to a degree realities on the ground, but also suggesting a lack maybe of, of clarity in terms of the interpretation, understanding of the process itself. 
Uh, I was uh, in particularly uh, um, uh, impressed by two, two interpretations that were out there. And uh, one would be uh, that of Stephen Kotkin. And uh, he, was, uh, he published a book on the late Soviet Union. Then there was a book on the uh, Armageddon Averted. And uh, then there was another book called uh, <clears throat> uh, Uncivil Society. And uh, uh, in the last book, he dealt with Eastern Europe mostly. But he said that the ideas that he presented in that book really occurred for the first time uh, when he was working on the history of the Soviet collapse. And uh, uh, Kotkin was pushing against, against the interpretation of the fall of communism, Soviet collapse, the collapse of communism in Eastern Europe as the sign of, first of all, of maturity of the civil society and second, of the victory of the civil society. And his argument was really the focus was on the uh, elites, on the communist elites, and the choices that they had and decisions that they had. And again, I found that very, very uh, um, interesting and insightful in terms of my own work, which very much was focused on the uh, key figures uh, uh, in the in the history of collapse. Uh, so that 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 was something really very very interesting and useful. And another another interpretation that I would like to mention here, and again I'm uh, just selecting some of them, is Mark Bisinger. And again, this is a contribution of a political scientist rather than a historian who did something that I even didn't imagine that was possible to collect data and information on the mass movements in the Soviet Union. And the dates, the participation, the, 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 the agendas. Uh, um, and he did, he did some really very, very interesting stuff with that, uh, with that database that he collected, uh, pointing that the, the mass mobilization in the Soviet Union uh, was happening, the, the major mobilization was really in uh, the non-Russian republics of the Soviet Union or in Russia also related to the, uh, to the um, challenge uh, presented by the rise of nationalism and national mobilization in non-Russian non republics. Um, so um, the issues of the, of the um, sovereignty of the uh, individual republics, the issues of the changes to the constitution, regulation on the ways in which the republics could or could not leave the Soviet Union. Uh, again, for me, that was an eye opener. And I mentioned uh, specifically works by uh, Kotkin and Bisinger because they turned out to be very useful for my own research, which uh, was the history of the fall of the Soviet Union from, uh, from above, written from above, not so much from below, but one thing that I wanted to do in that book was to have multiple perspectives. So I had that impression that when it comes to the key participants, uh, key figures, uh, the almost sole attention was on the uh, on Gorbachev and and Yeltsin, and the rivalry between of them and the contribution that that rivalry made to the fall of the Soviet Union. So. I didn't uh, deny the importance of that of that particular dynamics and that story, but I wanted to broaden the the scope by bringing mostly Ukraine and Ukrainian leadership. Ukraine turned out to be crucial for the final stage of the Soviet collapse, with the referendum on December first, nineteen ninety one, but also trying to bring when it is possible uh, uh, the Kazakhstan in particular a little bit of Uzbekistan. So again, they didn't get as much attention as uh, Ukraine and Russia, or Russia and Ukraine. But at least uh, again, I was trying to bring them into that, into in, into that frame, into that picture. And overall, my interpretation of the Soviet collapse, the frame that I used was the collapse of the empires in general. So that's that is the context in which I was put in the Soviet collapse, the, 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 the fall of the uh, other empires in the um, 20th century. And that's, that's what uh, I think uh, uh, probably is one of the um, uh, key contributions to, 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 to the discussion. 
Um, again, I, I will stop here and I really look forward to, to comments of uh, other people on the panel and then to the questions. Thank you so much, Professor uh, Plochi. Let's turn now um, in alphabetical order to Professor uh, Radchenko. Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me. So great to see all friends here. Um, uh, unlike my my uh, two distinguished uh, colleagues, I have not authored a book on the collapse of the Soviet Union. So uh, I, uh, of necessity, uh, must uh, uh, offer very preliminary observations. So Michael, as you mentioned, I have been writing a book uh, on the Cold War. It does include several chapters on Gorbachev and um, and that's what I will focus on, or at least try to give my very brief interpretation of um, those crucial years. Um, I, uh, my take would be very different uh, from what Professor Blohi just outlined um, in the sense that I look specifically at leaders in the whole book, uh, which covers Stalin really to Putin, uh, I look at leaders specifically because, of course, in the Soviet context, top leaders played an extraordinary uh, important role. Uh, the people did not really matter as much. The people's voice did not count as much. People could be you know, brainwashed, uh, could could uh, be molded into whatever you wanted them uh, to be. And it is really, it's not even the elites. I mean, the elites simply... Uh, followed whatever was decided at the very top, bureaucratically adjusting themselves to whatever decisions were being made. Uh, and, and, and it's really the leaders at the very top that matter. And I realized that this is a you know, form of a great man or great woman theory or something like that. But, you know, my counter argument to this would be, well, you know what? Now we have the documents. We can actually go to those leaders and we can see how decisions were made and what decisions were being made and why they were being made. It is like being in the room with them, reading all those records of discussions at the Politburo to see how they arrived at their various conceptions, to see how they were affected by particular psychological factors, how they saw themselves. This becomes extremely important for understanding the process of unraveling of the Soviet Union. Um, and uh, when you analyze, let's say you almost psychoanalyze, and this is maybe the wrong word, but when you when you look at these people like Gorbachev, you know, Gorbachev not the only one, you could look at Putin the same way, you could look at Stalin, you you sort of ask yourself, how what what was important for those people? How did they see the world? Um, and uh, you try to understand that maybe drawing on on psychological literature, you know, one I like a lot is uh, is is uh, is Maslow's pyramid of human needs, uh, articulated many many decades ago about what we need as human beings. And of course, you know, you will know this theory, the foundation. You've got security needs, some kind of you know housing, uh, biological needs, so to speak, etc. And then when you go up, you move up that pyramid, you get to that moment where or external recognition becomes very important. Do so you care about what others think about you, how they appraise your position in uh, in this world, as it were? And, and then you reach a kind of self-actualization. And you almost can apply that same approach to Soviet leaders uh, and indeed to the state itself, as it were. I know this would be dehumanizing the, 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 the theory, as it were, but you could argue that, you know, if you if you kind of take people out of this and what, what did the Soviet Union want? Was it some kind of security? Was it some kind of recognition? Was it some kind of self-actualization? What does it even mean anyway? So looking at Gorbachev, I would argue that, I mean, he was already quite secure. And this is the big mystery of Gorbachev. Here you've got somebody who rolls into the office, very young, and he could just stay. And I know people say, you know, you've got the whole guy Dar take about how uh, the Soviet uh, Union was already falling apart because it was facing this gigantic economic difficulties. Uh, I don't fully buy this. I think there's general consensus now among historians that the Soviet Union could have actually perse persevered, persisted for a much longer period of time if it weren't for the reforms that were being implemented from above. Uh, that were being imposed on the society, which was in many cases not particularly prepared for those reforms. 
But in any case, Gorbachev had all already. He had all, you know, he had complete power. He was God in a country where people are, where general secretaries were effectively worshipped like deities. So why would he continue? Why would he do something like this? Why would he launch on this path of reforms? And this is where we come to this mystery, uh, mystery of, of, of Gorbachev. Um, I'll, I'll give you just a couple of examples that I've looked at closely um, in the context of Gorbachev's policies. One was arms control and what drove him to um, uh, deal with arms control and actually genuinely try to achieve some kind of arms control agreement with uh, President Reagan. And there are different reasons for this. Uh, you can take a very idealistic approach and you can say, well, Gorbachev wanted simply, he was just afraid of a nuclear war, especially after Chernobyl, after April 1986, he just decided that nuclear war was such a horrible thing that you just simply had to really genuinely desire nuclear arms control. Uh, that would be very idealistic take. And I once raised this actually with uh, uh, Pavel Palashenko, who many of you would know. And I asked, you know, was it for real or was it propaganda? And he said, no, no, it was all for real. We really believed in this. We really believed in this. And, you know, I, of course, I'm a 1990s generation. I just tend to be a little bit cynical just by very nature. You know, a lot of Russians are kind of, you know, half this experience are a little bit cynical. Uh, and I said, I just can't believe that. You know, how could you be so naive about this? And I said, no, no, we really believed in nuclear free world, et cetera, we were pushing towards. But there are different, you know, there's another approach to this. And you could say, well, the Soviet Union was simply running out of money and they knew they could not compete with the United States. Therefore, they had to cut arms. And that's another possible approach. Uh, or, and here's an interesting one, I'll just throw it out for you because I do consider this closely in my work. And that is that you want to seize moral leadership in the world. And this actually goes to what uh, uh, Sergei was just saying about, um, about this question of ideological bankruptcy of the Soviet idea. The idea was dead. You have to replace it with something. Oh, hello, you've got perestroika and you thinking that you roll in and you say, this is for not our country, but also for the entire world. The whole world should embrace this because this is what now the Soviet Union represents. And this is what Gorbachev was trying to do with new thinking. Uh, and arms control was an important part of that. So you could see how he could he was trying to reinvent himself, reinvent the Soviet Union and, and, and attain some kind of recognition and seize moral leadership in the world through doing that very thing. So you can see a very multi kind, what do you call that? A multi, uh, uh, multi causal approach uh, to, to my understanding of Gorbachev. Uh, Michael, how many, I forget how, how much time do we have? Do I have another couple of minutes? Because I've got one more example if I, if I have time, but if not, I can leave. Okay, go right ahead. Please, please, please uh, use all one, the examples that you wish to. All right, one more example that I wanted to mention that is also very interesting is withdrawal from Afghanistan. Again, different approaches have been offered for that. One that I think is completely um, uh, baseless is the notion that the Soviet Union withdrew from Afghanistan because it was bankrupted by Afghanistan or that it was, you know, about to, and that Afghanistan somehow contributed to Soviet collapse. Well, that connection is maybe more arguable, but the notion the Soviet Union simply could not carry on, it's just not true. The Soviet Union could have carried on this uh, misadventure in Afghanistan for a very, very long time. Um, but if you look at decision making about why Gorbachev decided to pull out, I mean, he first of all, even coming into the office in 1985, he realized that as he put it, it was a bleeding wound. So it had to be brought to an end somehow. But why did it take so long? Several years before Gorbachev actually decided to finally quit Afghanistan, and for a time he was trying to fix the problem and just you know somehow restart the national reconciliation process. And this is very interesting. So one, why did he say it was a bleeding wound? Because it it hurts Soviet reputation, global reputation. At one level, you're saying, oh, we are this new thinking. You know, we are trying to remake the world. This, at the, uh, on the other hand, you're fighting a colonial war in Afghanistan. Well, that doesn't really work. You know, that undermines your reputation. So that is part of the reason. The, but on the other hand, the reason, one of the key reasons why it took so long for the Soviet uh, for the Soviet Union to withdraw from Afghanistan was that Gorbachev understood that if the Soviet 
power would take a hit, would lose in terms of its credibility. And when speaking about Afghanistan, he repeatedly referred to that. He said, you know, what will they think about us in the third world? If we just quit Afghanistan like this, they'll think that we are not a great power, that we cannot be believed like this. So it was the same credibility problems, problem that the Americans also faced in Vietnam. It's an issue generally you know, great powers face, the issue of credibility. So again, you can see that he wanted to be recognized for something new, for some great you know, brave ideas, but he also wanted to be recognized for greatness as, a, as a, that that he was a leader of a great superpower. And there was a clash there that resulted in a kind of a procrastination in Afghanistan. That's why it took, I guess, such a long time for the Soviet uh, Soviets to withdraw. Uh, although very early, even before Gorbachev, for this matter, already by 8081, the Soviets understood that it was a, had been a fatal, fatal mistake. So finally, uh, 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 the the last the last point is, of course, that you know that comes to mind is the Soviet withdrawal from Eastern Europe. And here again, different explanations are being offered about why Gorbachev did it. And the, I think the, the most current, the one that really kind of uh, people like to talk about, is that he was averse to the use of force. That he simply, as a, as the somebody who came from the 1960s, in terms of his you know political upbringing. Uh, well, not, that's not quite right, but he was of that generation, if you were what I'm trying to say. Um, and, uh, you know, he just did not want, he was the he was the one who was really just upset with the Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia and so on and so forth. So he could not uh, even possibly contemplate the use of force to keep the Soviet empire in Eastern Europe. And when looking at this closely in my, in my, in my book, I, I discovered that uh, the, it, it's not it's not the only explanation. It's actually much more complicated. And the the key explanation, or at least one of the key factors for Soviet failure to intervene in Europe in 1989, was actually this very bizarre and but at another level quite an easy question. Okay, so we intervene, and then what do we do at this point? How are we going to feed Eastern Europe that is on the brink of economic meltdown so that we don't have the money to keep going in Eastern Europe? Therefore, it was already clear during solidarity in Poland almost a decade earlier, the Soviets were running out of money. So therefore, when Gorbachev discussed this question in the Politburo, he would say, well, you know what? We just simply we don't have the money. We don't know what to do with them. Uh, therefore, you know, this is one of the factors. I mean, I'm not saying that he was not averse to the use of force, although sometimes on occasion he would actually use force in other circumstances. So there was much more complexity to this. But fundamentally, fundamentally in Eastern Europe, I think the question that really drove Gorbachev is he stood for something. He stood for an idea. He stood for this reformed socialism, for something that was supposed to be something new. And he got a lot of recognition for it from the West as a guy who doesn't do this kind of thing like what Brezhnev did or Khrushchev did in 1956. Therefore, this idea of breaking this and actually trying to hold on by force would have undermined his muscle pyramid it would you know his his whole idea of self-actualization would have to be thrown down uh down the drain so he actually decided to continue with this image of himself as the leader of of reformed socialism even if that meant undermining the foundations of the very state which permitted him to to take this role so there was a contradiction there uh but gorbachev persisted and of course as a result he lost control uh and also here well, <clears throat> as a Washingtonian, I'm shocked that neither of our two speakers has mentioned Ronald Reagan uh, as the obvious reason for the collapse of the uh, of the Soviet Union. But I'll I will I will I will um, uh, you know sort of save my question about that for later if 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 uh, if necessary. I do have a question forming in my mind about uh, metropole and, and periphery, which is of course one of the oldest questions in the history of uh, of empire. But uh, I will again wait uh, until our a uh, third speaker weighs in uh, to ask that question. So let's turn the floor now to Professor uh, Professor Zubak. Well, I have just published a very long book on this. And by the way, it was not 2001, it was 2021. So it's recent <clears throat> and it's out in paperback. Um, but that means only that I, I will try to be brief because I wrote many things that I you know, wanted to write. Um, but... Uh, Thank you, Michael, for inviting me uh, and uh, to pay back my debt. I will mention Reagan because uh, uh, in in those interpretations that here he uh, began to uh, to lay out. Of course, there are a few you can categorize. Kotkin is slightly uh, out of easy categorization, I should say. Uh, but if you look at the narratives, uh, for me. 
um, there are uh, four at least. Um, there's uh, the Cold War pressures. And yes, uh, there's a popular American myth that uh, Ronald Reagan uh, somehow magically destroyed the wall and then, of course, bank bankrupted the Soviet Union. It's a very nice and comforting mythology for Americans. Uh, but that, there's a whole literature on Cold War pressures. Um, the second narrative is uh, uh, the Soviet Union collapsed under the weight of its uh, economic malfunctioning uh, combined with its multiple sins. Uh, so it was completely, uh, you know, completely unworkable. Uh, but I would sort of uh, digest it as an economic explanation, uh, something that very few people really understood. I would argue nobody understood, but very many people wanted to quote, uh, because, of course, uh, if the Soviets couldn't buy toilet paper, that meant, uh, you know, that system had to go. Um, and, you know, there was this, of course, a very uh, important and very interesting narrative of the last empire. And uh, here, of course, is my uh, Mark Basinger is is, uh, is a wonderful example, but also uh, Serhii Plokhi's book is, is is a remarkable contribution to this narrative. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, uh, when Sergei Rachenko uh, spoke, I. Uh, it reminded me of, of a very important fourth uh, narrative, which surrounded me actually when I, you know, I uh, was uh, much younger, thirty years ago, twenty-five years ago. The ideational or ideational moral narrative, and of course, I would bring up a name of my old, old colleague um, uh, Rob English and Russia and an idea of the West. Uh, it's a very good book still, and it sort of yes. Uh, relates to what Sergei just been speaking about uh, people at the top uh, suddenly changing their ideas or forming their ideas and or following these ideas to the end, uh, uh, to the destruction of, of the state. Uh, however, when I began to write uh, my book, uh, which roughly coincided with the time when Sergei published his book, um, I was uh, influenced by... Uh, by uh, the fact that still, uh, uh, and I actually think, Sergei, you, you mentioned it uh, at some point to me, that even at the end of its existence, the Soviet Union turned out to be a very resilient subject, a tenacious subject, some would say. You know, it was, you know, it could have been buried many, many times, and still it kind of uh, continued on and on, almost to, to the last uh, months of 1991. Very, very surprising. So uh, in, in a way, uh, this is not my nature as a historian, but, uh, but when I uh, uh, was writing my book, I decided to push against all of those narratives, which is probably unwise wise uh but uh you know here here what happened um I was influenced to an extent by late Bob Jervis uh you know I call him uh, the best uh, political scientist for historians and 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 Bob spoke about perceptions and misperceptions and, and also sort of uh, it occurred to me that the Soviet collapse was such a rupture in history and such an enormous uh, end of continuity, and it caused such an utter surprise um, that it amounted sort of a cognitive dissonance. And the only way to uh, fix this uh, cognitive dissonance for many people from uh, statesmen who were utterly uh, shocked by this collapse uh, to 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 theorists and historians was a confirmation bias and bob bob jervis wrote a lot about this confirmation bias you know it, it, it's essentially what helps you to uh you know to 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 close the gap between what why why did we all fail to to perceive it um and and uh, the result was kind of surprising um, you know, so many people thought that the Soviet collapse was unthinkable before 1991, and all of them began to think that it was inevitable after 1991. And that was, you know, uh, in a sense, my methodological, uh, my methodological uh, flagpole and uh, flagpost, and which I try to follow. Um, you know, um, to write a book against historical determinism. Um, hey, everyone quotes 
uh, Andrei Amalric, uh, will the Soviet Union survive until 1984? Amalric lived in the Soviet Union. He knew nothing about Soviet economics. He knew very little about international relations and so on and so forth. And yet he wrote his provocative pamphlet. And, uh, you know, now everyone quotes it, uh, which makes me think maybe I should write a provocative pamphlet. Will the European Union survive 2028 or something? And uh, maybe someday people will start quoting me uh, or not. Uh, uh, this is, uh, you know, intellectuals and theorists tend to produce these pamphlets, but it doesn't mean uh, they are prophets. Uh, it just, you know, they hit it right or hit it very, very wrong. Uh, so my take uh, is, um, when you read the book, that the collapse was triggered by Gorbachev's reforms, highly ideational reforms, mis misguided reforms. Uh, were other, were uh it, was it possible uh, to, to, to do reforms differently? Yes. I think Andropov was uh, starting to, to move in this direction. Was the USSR reformable? Uh, a bigger question. The debate is still out. But uh, the collapse itself does not prove that the Soviet Union was not uh, reformable. And uh, when you read the wonderful polemic, uh, old polemic between Stephen F. Kotkin, Mark Kramer, and others about ideology, system, state, country, those were different dimensions. It was possible to get rid of the uh, ideology, even system, even external empire, but to keep the state, to keep the party state, and so on and so forth. All kinds of combinations uh, could be possible. Um, I would like to uh, focus on two questions and then uh, two points and then would leave the floor for, 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 for the discussion. Um, you know, when uh, I read Basinger and, of course, uh, Serhii's book um, on the Ukrainians and, the, and you know, of course, I read about what the Bulls did, the Georgians did. Um, it is a very seductive form of historical determinism that um, the time for empires uh, is gone. And therefore, the Soviet Union is the last empire had to go. Uh, why is a historical, a form of historical determinism? Go and talk to imperialists that the empire should go. Go to talk and, and talk to, you know, Vladimir Putin today about it. Uh, in, in fact, if you look at the history of empire's downfall, you don't find uh, very easy, uh, you know, uh, divorces or reconciliations. Or even the British Empire, you don't find um, even uh, the Ottoman Empire that was a sick man of Europe and suffered from many more malfunctions and, and problems than the Soviet Union. In 1990, 1991, but only World War One, uh, you know, um, shattered that empire. So I kept thinking about this wider, uh, broader uh, concept of history, not to fall into this pit of historical determinism. So what I found is very interesting. It was a unique moment when uh, all these factors, uh, economic ideational, external pressures, and others. Uh, merged into a perfect storm. So here I agree with Sergei Rachenko, it was multi-causality. But what was more important that some liberal intellectuals in Moscow uh, borrowed Western Cold War notions of the Soviet empire as doomed. And what is so unique that Boris Yeltsin took the same thing up as a guide for his political action, for his own political reasons. And finally, the Russians, millions of Russians, followed Yeltsin uh, to destroy their own empire because they had enough of hapless Gorbachev. And that's an interesting story uh, in itself. Um, the second point is specifically about Ukraine. We may have a discussion or not, but I think that uh, it's not so linear to look at uh, the wake up of Ukrainian nationalism or Ukrainian republic. Uh, because even in the fall of 1990, well, here he may correct me or not, uh, Ukraine was a really, really quiet place that very few people could even imagine that uh, a year later it would be on a glorious path to full independence. Uh, you know, the Kiev apparatchiks uh, 
watched very carefully the relationship between Gorbachev and Yeltsin. As long as those two men stayed in a tactical alliance, uh, Kiev did nothing. But after they broke, uh, you know, I think it would have been more pragmatic for for Ukraine, or for Kiev at least, the Kiev communist apparatchiks, to side with Gorbachev because Gorbachev made all those concessions. Gorbachev built a federated center, but what decided everything was Gorb- Gorby's weakness and the fact that Yeltsin wanted everything. So it was Yeltsin's drive to for Russia's sovereignty against the center that in the end almost forced the Kiev on um, you know, um, communist nomenclatura to take care of their own interests and go for independence. I will not mention the last point on the West and the search of legitimacy and recognition that all the republics, including Yeltsin and Gorbachev, uh, uh, pursued at that time. That's a, that's a remarkable phenomenon. I'm looking forward to reading uh, Sergei Rachenko's book. I know that's one of his main thesis, uh, that the, even Stalin yearned for some recognition, not to mention Khrushchev, Brezhnev, and so on and so forth. So, um, and that's, fasc- that's a fascinating point, definitely to be explored. But um, having lived through some of the Brezhnev era um, and the drop of and uh, early Gorbachev, I think there was a really unique point uh, roughly since 1986, 87, when all of a sudden this question of values, of recognition, of international, what international community will say, what they will tell about us, all of a sudden ballooned beyond, uh, you know, whatever it was a normal thing before. So for me, it's again part of that uniqueness of the moment of Soviet collapse, not just the slow uh, accretion of certain factors that in the end uh, broke the camel's back. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much. Let me paraphrase just <clears throat> very briefly of three, I think, separate historiographical endeavors. Broadening the scope, as Professor Plucky mentions, uh, examining the psychology of leadership, as Professor Rodchenko mentions, uh, and looking into uh, the sort of uh, malfunctioning of reforms, uh, uh, you know, Gorbachev, Yeltsin, uh, and others, as Professor Zubok mentions. I'm going to go in opposite order now. Um, so it will be, I guess, uh, Rodchenko is still in the uh, in the middle. It will be Rodchenko, uh, rather Zubok, Rodchenko, Plochi, uh, and then we'll turn to students' questions. And I want to ask you, <laughs> give you three options in terms of of of, uh, of where you can go at the moment, just to respond uh, to what your uh, fellow historian said. Uh, that would be one option. Secondly, to speak about sources. Uh, because if if I've correctly paraphrased your three separate historiographical endeavors, they do call on a different base of sources. Uh, and so to what degree does the availability of sources or the sources that you choose to look at affect the narrative that you later uh, create? Or thirdly, uh, and this you know echoes through comments of both Professor Zubok and Professor, Professor Plochi, the proper relationship between metropole and periphery. Uh, in your analysis of the collapse of the Soviet Union. Professor Plochi mentioned uh, Ukraine, of course, but also Kazakhstan, and one could put the Baltic republics and uh, other factors into the uh, into the mix. And so those would be the three options in terms of the comment at this point, and then we'll see what the students' questions are. Either just a response to your fellow historians speaking about sources, uh, or this uh, huge imperial question of the metropole's relation to the periphery, and of course, of the periphery's relationship to the metropole. So, Professor Zubak, we'll start with you. If you want to address one of those three pieces, that would be that would be great. Well, I would like to start uh, with uh, your last question, Michael, about metropole and periphery. And yeah, so you know, it was a dynamic relationship. <laughs> Needless to say, you know, but the reforms uh, were initiated uh, before anything started on the periphery. The reforms came from Moscow. They had been in uh, gestation since uh, late Brezhnev times. Of course, there n- nobody knew about it. Um, you know this remarkable episode when an Andropov called on uh, uh, on, on the Bolsky's 
um, deputy to to change uh, to redraft the map of the Soviet Union, get rid of these fifteen republics. Essentially, he said he called an academician Velikov. Uh, you know, that was my chance. I reached uh, academician Velikov. Unfortunately, he was well beyond eighty, and he said, "I don't remember anything about this." So, unfortunately, I couldn't confirm <laughs> it. So, the reforms came from the um, uh, metropole, a uh, metropole. Uh, metropolis, uh, and and then uh, at the very moment that uh, those reforms were released in the form of constitutional changes, uh, that was this explosion on the periphery. Explosion on the periphery, of course, in the, in South Caucasus and in, in the Baltics. And from then on, it was uh, this active live interrelationship. Um, you know, without going for too long, and I want others to answer this question, I thought that until uh, until the fall of 1990, that was this there was still a strong chance for the center for the met, uh, metropolis to retake the initiative and retake levers and control over increasingly chaotic and quite violent sometimes uh, process. Um, you know, the, the main uh, leverage that, in my opinion, could have been used was, uh, was economic, economic reform, market reform, because as, as, as we know, uh, the traumatic transition to capitalism, to market, uh, changes so much. And at least for a while, um, you know, there's a shock. There is a shock that uh, pushes aside everything, even including nationalism. So I thought that would have been definitely the way for the center to take reins of uh, economic reforms, impose this uh, narrative of reforms on the peripheries. And we know that even the Balts, who always wanted to secede, even the Balts at the time cooperated with, with the Moscow group of reformers on this. So, uh, you know, after the fall of, uh, after Gorbachev blew it, in the, you know, in, in the fall of 1990, uh, most of uh, sources say that it was, um, you know, it was irreversible. Um, I still don't think it was irreversible, but those who dealt with economy and finances say so. Uh, on the sources, it's a big question. I, I was surprised just for, for those graduate students who were listening, I was surprised how much is available. And, and Sergei will confirm, you know, uh, I think all of us, three, three of us here uh, um, who wrote whatever we wrote, scratched the surface. There's a mountain of evidence that remains to be uh, picked by anybody who is interested in this period, uh, either in various republics. One of my graduate students did an excellent, uh, uh, Isaac Scarborough did an excellent dissertation on uh, Tajikistan. Uh, just wonderful stuff everywhere in Moscow archives and in, in the Republican archives. So uh, what, uh, uh, where I felt lucky, where I felt lucky that from the very beginning of, um, uh, from, I would say from 1991 on, I had uh, pretty good access to uh, witnesses. Uh, both on the Soviet side, American side, and you know, my last big uh, uh, um, uh, success uh, was talking to Gennady Burbulis uh, for six hours during pandemic. Uh, little did I know that he would die uh, so soon after that, but that was a very, very important interview for me. So I would just let other people comment. Wonderful, let's turn now to Professor Rodchenko and then after that to Professor Pocky and then, and then you can start Please, uh, dear students, you can start to formulate your own questions. Uh, I uh, wholeheartedly agree with what uh, Professor Zubuk has just uh, referred to in, in terms of how how the relationship between the center and the periphery unfolded. Just a couple of additional points. Uh, one it relates to this question of identity, which is an interesting um, question that is sometimes not studied enough or closely enough 
and by historians looking at this period, was there such a thing as a Soviet identity? Most definitely, we know there was something called Soviet identity, but there were also other identities that people might have. And they were not necessarily just Republican. They could be local identities. It could be an identity of belonging to a particular class or a particular group of people, or et cetera, et cetera. So what we had you know, is, is a process where, where you had fluid overlapping identities and the idea that one of these identities would actually predominate in the end was by no means predetermined. I think Professor Zubak actually writes about this in his book. Uh, so what, what fascinates me is just how those identities are then forged. Uh, and then in you know, retrospect, so people say, well, looking back, there was always this identity and there was always something called, you know, I don't know, the Turkmen nation, et cetera, et cetera. And it was just dominated by the Soviet empire. And maybe this is true. But in my opinion, at least in the way I approach this, I see a lot of overlapping and shifting identities. And people are also, you know, people embrace identities that are available to them and sometimes prioritize one over another, uh, depending on a wide range of economic, political, and other circumstances in order to improve their position in life, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and the second point is patterns of authority, of course, change, and then you have shift in loyalty. So for most of the people, you know, most of the people who talk about the people, not the elites and not the people, or even the elites, but you know, generally speaking, people tend to sit on the fence when major political events unfold. They're not sure where this is going. They're not sure how things will unfold. But in the end, they 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 see how patterns of authority start to shift and they make decisions. They come off the fence and they come on one side of the fence or the other side of the fence. And those kind of uh, events also happened uh, for elites of the of of the Soviet space as the Soviet Union started to unravel, uh, elites had to make their mind about who they would support and what identity they would embrace. And studying how this actually came together is fascinating for me. Fascinating. I don't I don't believe in primordial identities. Yeah, I think the reason why I don't believe in primordial identities is my own identity is very uh, uh, undetermined, as it were. It, it keeps shifting all the time. But that is because you know I I recognize that I'm I'm a, I'm a uh, 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 a result of various social forces that act upon me, and but the same way they act upon every other, every other, uh, every, all, all other people. That's just a philosophical reflection. Completely endorse what Professor Zubok said about archives. There's remarkable openness in terms of archival sources, uh, basically across much of the former Soviet space, but especially, and this is remarkable and very counterintuitive, in Moscow, where in recent years there has been a tremendous openness in the archives. Unfortunately, of course, due to uh, uh, political circumstances that we all, we all know of, it has become more difficult for Western scholars to go there and take advantage of that. But at least so far, I have not seen them actually closing down the archives. It seems that the archives remain open. I don't know how to explain this disconnect between, generally speaking, a kind of a more constrained space for political expression, for media, et cetera, and yet openness of the archives. But that also is, is as, as Professor Zubok said, is, of course, uh, uh, also the case in many other, uh, uh, other post-Soviet of Soviet countries. Uh, for my own research, I've benefited enormously from personal archives of the leaders. And that is where I put a lot of emphasis. That's why I put a lot of emphasis on understanding a leaders. It is like being a psychoanalyst or some kind of psychiatrist sitting in the room with them. Because what we have, and not with just with Gorbachev, but with Brezhnev and, and, and Khrushchev especially, we have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of various you know, conversations they held and various meetings they participated in were just, just dialogues, et cetera. And you listen to the same stories again and again, and you listen to what they have to say and how they react to certain things and various, you know, uh, biases and prejudices that they have. And you start to understand them as people. And that is why you, you can actually uh, find the reasons for why certain decisions were made actually looking at how those decisions were being made, how they were being explained. So that's how I would explain my approach, very kind of psychoanalytical, focused on very specific people. But in the Soviet case, it's actually uh, warranted where it may not be warranted in other cases where you do not have such strong central authority. In reality, in the Soviet case, so many decisions were actually made by the top leaders and everybody just fell into the line, frankly. So that is why I've adopted 
to this approach, completely unapologetic about it. Uh, so I'll stop here. Okay, stop without apology. Uh, that sounds <laughs> that sounds very reasonable, Professor Plucky. Uh, you'll get the last word here, and then we'll have our open discussion. Sure. Uh, thank you. Well, uh, first of all, uh, I certainly agree with Vlad and Sergey in terms of the uh, really uh, enormous amount of sources that are out there. And uh, it all depends on the questions that we are asking. And even if you look at the big personalities like Gorbachev or, or Bush or uh, Yeltsin, even there, there is uh, an enormous number of, uh, and, and really uh, hundreds and thousands of untapped sources. But imagine if you start to write the history of the Soviet Union from below. And if you start to write the history of the Soviet Union, not just from the, uh, either Moscow or the Republican capitals, the uh, mm, kind of questions that you ask will change, the kind of sources that you ask will change, and the, 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 uh, mm, also the, the number of sources will increase itself. So the fall of the Soviet Union is, is a very important, it's, it's a history changing moment. There will be generations and generations of people working on that. And I think that what, what whom you see here in front of you, we are fortunately or unfortunately just the first, uh, the, first uh, the, the, the first group, the, 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 the pioneers, and there will be tens and, 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 and hundreds of people who just walk, walk uh, um, through us and, and, and will we'll continue this research. And I'm sure that some of those people are certainly here in the audience as well. Uh, in terms of the questions that were asked beyond, beyond sources, uh, and this is about periphery and, and the center. Uh, the the uh, uh, history of the, of the fall of the Soviet Union, like history of fall of any state, imperial or not imperial, uh, brings together a combination of factors. And uh, the decisions at the center are extremely important. Uh, but it also uh, the the uh, uh, action and reaction of the street, multiple street, uh, is something that we should keep in mind. And when it comes to the fall of the Soviet Union, something that would be understood very specific, not the fall of the Communist Party, not the fall of the uh, uh, Soviet economy, not the fall of the superpower status and, and losing the Cold War, but the disintegration of the state called the Soviet Union into 15 republics. The story uh, in terms uh, really, really starts and begins in the, in the periphery. And the Baltic states here are really in, in the lead. Uh, what I see basically being in common between the fall of the Soviet Union and the fall of the, of the rest of the empires is that the Soviet Union falls on the, on the issue and on the matter of citizenship. So the citizenship, uh, uh, which would be understood in the Soviet context as the right to vote. So the key element from my perspective point of view perspective in the, uh, in the fall of the Soviet Union were the introduction of the electoral democracy and elements of electoral democracy by Gorbachev in the Soviet Union. And the first group that took advantage of that and took in the most effective way through the mass vote were the uh, national and nationalist movements in the, in the republics, in the Baltic states in particular. Again, the, the, the Gorbachev allowed the, the relatively democratic process of the election to the parliaments of the republics because the republics decided nothing. And immediately what you get are, of course, votes for sovereignty and eventually in March of 1990 vote for, for independence of Lithuania. And then, of course, Russia and Yeltsin and people around him react to that, embracing Russia, embracing the Russian parliament as the way to, to uh, deal with 
issues of reform and many other issues. But the idea that you have to take this parliament, that you have to claim sovereignty, certainly doesn't come from uh, Yeltsin, doesn't come from Moscow. It comes from Baltic states in this, uh, or Baltic republics in that sense. So there, the way how I see the periphery and in particular the Baltic republics are extremely important. Uh, going to Ukraine and importance of Ukraine. Um, Ukraine produces actually more dissidents uh, than any other non-Russian republic in the in the Soviet Union. Uh, Solzhenitsyn writes, of course, about about the the uh, enormous numbers of the of the uh, Ukrainians in the Gulag. Mostly the, the members or the people who are accused of participating in the uh, nationalist resistance after the war. But then you look at the Helsinki group and so on and so forth. The Ukraine is second close to the, to the capitals, to Moscow in particular. But that's not the importance of Ukraine in my, in, in my <clears throat> interpretation. Ukrainian vote for independence on the 24th of August of 1991 was done with the help of the majority vote of the communist part of the parliament. And that's the game changer. That's the game changer because the majority of other republics and legislatures were controlled by the communists. And uh, the, the vote of the communists is very much reaction to what is happening in Moscow. Uh, but I would, I would uh, um, take. I have a, a little bit different take on that uh, in comparison to Vlad, because they vote against the union once uh, Yeltsin tries to take over the union uh, immediately after the coup. So they, 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 they would work and continue working with Gorbachev, but they re rebel against Yeltsin not as against leader of Russia, because. Yeltsin as leader of Russia isn't their interest, but against Yeltsin as a possible number one in Moscow, the leader, the leader of the Soviet Union. And there is an attempt in the late August of 1991 on the part of, of Yeltsin to take over the, the, uh, Soviet, the Soviet institutions. Uh, neither Yeltsin nor Gaidar, and he writes about that in his memoirs of whoever drafted those memoirs for him, uh, clearly, they are not uh, crazy in August of 1991 about pushing anyone outside uh, out of the of the union. And uh, uh, the uh, Belavesha agreement start with Yeltsin seriously or not seriously starting the conversation. The saying, "Okay, Mr. Kravchuk, would you sign the the agreement uh, of the renewed union?" The creation of the Commonwealth of Independent States certainly uh, envisions the, the uh, dominant dominant role of Russia in, in, in that story as well. So um, I would I would suggest that uh, Yeltsin's uh, drive towards the sovereignty of Russia really uh, undergoes a major and dramatic change after the August uh, coup of 1991 when the Gorbachev is significantly diminished in power. So there are at least two, two Russians in that story and two, uh, two uh, Yeltsins in that story as well. Um, again, we are, we are looking at the event in the 20th century uh, happening at the same time as the fall of the um, uh, um, Yugoslavia, the, uh, the, the disintegration of Czechoslovakia. Uh, again, if if uh, the term empire sounds sounds maybe too too offensive, we can look at the multi ethnic state. But that's that's uh, the one of the biggest biggest uh, developments of the 20th century. You can look at the map to see the number of states in 1914, the number of states in 1991. So this is a global process that we just can't ignore looking at contingencies only. And uh, then, then um, a, few, a few comments on, on uh, uh, what Sergei was saying. And I think that, that uh, again, uh, uh, Afghanistan, Afghanistan and its, its role and impact. I, I basically, uh, 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 of the opinion, it seems to me of the same opinion as Sergei, that it's 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 
really matters what what you make out of a particular development uh, rather than a development itself. Uh, because Afghanistan got a lot of traction in terms of the interpretation of the Soviet collapse. But when you look at the impact of the Afghan war, the, the way whether there is a mass mobilization or not, Af Afghanistan, for example, is dwarfed by the reaction to Chernobyl. Again, important development in its own right. But again, Afghanistan also, if you compare it to Vietnam in terms or even the current Russian war in Ukraine. The number of people killed was, was relatively minuscule, 15,000, 16,000, and the Soviet Union, of course, had control over, over the information. So that's, that's, uh, that, that, that is important. And again, uh, in terms of uh, counting money in Eastern Europe, yes, the, the, the decision not to intervene in 1981 in, in Poland certainly is already motivated by, by that thinking. In that sense, uh, Despite this major dramatic break between the Brezhnev doctrine and the Sinatra doctrine, uh, there is more continuation than 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 uh, difference between uh, uh, between those two 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 approaches. So uh, again, uh, thanks, and and I, I really enjoyed presentations by by my colleagues. Wonderful. <clears throat> I somehow wish that we had three hours to go into the distinction between the history of identity and the history of citizenship, uh, as has been outlined, but I think uh, I've asked enough questions.